On Friday, March 31st, I supped with Johnson and some friends at a tavern. One of the company, a later footnote tells us this, one of the company was actually Boswell, attempted, with too much forwardness, to rally him on his late appearance at the theater, but had reason to repent of his temerity. Why, sir, did you go to Miss Abington's benefit? Did you see? Johnson said, No, sir. Did you hear? Johnson said, No, sir. Why then, sir, did you go? Johnson answered, Because, sir, she is a favorite of the public, and when the public cares the thousandth part for you that it does for her, I will go to your benefit too. Next morning, I won a small bet from Lady Diana Beauclerk by asking him as to one of his particularities, which her ladyship laid I durst not do. It seems he had been frequently observed at the club to put into his pocket the several oranges after he had squeezed the juice of them into the drink which he made for himself. Beauclerk and Garlic Garrick talked of it to me, and seemed to think that he had a strange unwillingness to be discovered. We could not divide, divine what he did with them, and this was the bold question to be put. I saw on his table the spoils of the preceding night, some fresh peels nicely scraped and cut into pieces. Oh, sir, said I, I now partly see what you do with the squeezed oranges which you put into your pocket at the club. Johnson answered, I have a great love for them. I said, And pray, sir, what do you do with them? You scrape them, it seems, very neatly, and what next? Johnson said, I let them dry, sir. I said, And what next? Johnson said, Nay, sir, you shall know their fate no further. I said, Then the world must be left in the dark. It must be said, Assuming a mock solemnity, He scraped them and let them dry. But what he didn't with them next, he never could be prevailed upon to tell. Johnson said, Nay, sir, you should say it more emphatically. He could not be prevailed upon, even by his dearest friends, to tell. What do you think, dear reader or dear listener? What do you think Johnson did with these arrays? He had this morning received his diploma as Doctor of Laws from the University of Oxford. He did not vaunt of his new dignity, but I understood he was highly pleased with it. I shall here insert the progress and completion of that high academical honor in the same manner as I have traced as obtaining that of Master of Arts. To the Reverend Dr. Fothergill, Vice Chancellor of the University of Oxford, to be communicated to the heads of houses and proposed in convocation. Mr. Vice-Chancellor and gentlemen, the honor of the degree of M.A., Master of Arts, by diploma, formally conferred upon Mr. Samuel Johnson, in consequence of his having eminently distinguished himself by the publication of a series of essays, excellently calculated to form the manners of the people, and in which the cause of religion and mortality have been maintained and recommended by the strongest powers of argument and elegance of language, reflected as an equal degree of luster upon the university itself. The many learned labors which have since that time employ the attention and display the abilities of that great man, so much to the advancement of literature and the benefit of the community, render him worthy of more distinguished honors in the Republic of Letters, and I persuade myself that I shall act agreeably to the sentiments of the whole university in desiring that it may be proposed in convocation to confer on him the degree of doctor in civil law by diploma, to which I readily give my consent, and am, Mr. Vice-Chancellor and gentlemen, your affectionate friend and servant, Downing Street, March 23rd, 1775, North. Extracted from the Convocation Register of Oxford. Diploma. Now, I don't remember last time if I read this entire thing in Latin for the Master of Arts, but I'm not going to do that again, if I did. I don't think I did. 
I'll spare you. But uh, let's see. I gotta figure out how to read this. Okay, so basically it's two pages of Latin, if you can see, and then the long footnote with the uh, translation. So I'll just read the translation. Um, you must know. Uh, you must know that the illustrious Samuel Johnson, a man learned in all humane letters and happy in his grasp of the sciences, long since became so famous for his writings, eminently calculated in form and matter to improve the manners of his countrymen, that the university th thought him worthy of signal honor and so enthralled him among its honored masters. Now, whereas this distinguished man has won such repute by his subsequent labors, notably in refining and fixing our language, that he is justly reckoned a chief and leader in the Republic of Letters. Therefore, we, the Chancellor, Master, and Scholars of the University of Oxford, wishing at once to honor him as he deserves, and to record our own devotion to letters, have in our solemn convocation of doctors and masters made the said Samuel Johnson a doctor of civil law, and have by the present diploma made him free of all the rights and privileges that begin belong to that degree. Uh, then there's a note here from... I'm just making sure that's everything on here. There's a couple things that aren't translated, but they're just uh, preliminary stuff, I think. Uh, okay. Then there's a note here from Boswell. The original is in my possession. Oh, that's pretty good. He showed me the diploma and allowed me to read it, but would not consent to my taking a copy of it, fearing perhaps that I should blaze it abroad in his lifetime. His objection to this appears from his 99th letter to Mrs. Thrale, whom in that letter he thus scolds for the grossness of her flattery of him. Quote, the other Oxford news is that they have sent me a degree of Doctor of Laws, with such praises in the diploma as perhaps ought to make me ashamed. They are very like your praises. I wonder whether I shall ever show it to you. Unquote. It is remarkable that he never, so far as I know, assumed his title of Doctor, but called himself Mr. Johnson, as appears from many of his cards or notes to myself. And I have seen many from him to other persons in which he uniformly takes that designation. I once observed on his table a letter directed to him with the addition of Esquire, and objected to it as being a designation inferior to that of Doctor. But he checked me, and seemed pleased with it, because, as I conjectured, he liked to be sometimes taken out of the class of literary men, and to be merely genteel. Un gentle homme comme un autre. Yeah. Nope, oh, I got something sticking on me. Here I am thinking I'm classy. Ah, okay, so then there's a translation of this next part. I need not use many words to tell you how I received the commendation with which the university over which you preside has transmitted my name to posterity. Um... Every man is glad to think well of himself, and that man must think well of himself, of whom you, the arbitrators of letters, can think well. But the good you have done me has one drawback. Henceforth, any fault of mine, of commission or omission, will hurt your reputation. I must always fear that what is a signal honor to me may one day bring discredit upon you. It's too bad people that get um, honorary degrees don't feel like that anymore, huh? Looking at you, Bill Cosby. So the original in this is in the hands of Dr. Fothergill, then Vice Chancellor, who made this transcript, T. Wharton. It's a little confusing because I'm not really sure uh, what that's what part that's translating here. I guess this there's a section up here that I believe that's the uh, translation of. Anyway, let's move, up. let's move on. 
Uh, Johnson received, revised some sheets of Lord Hale's Annals of Scotland and wrote a few notes on the margin with red ink, which he bade me to tell his lordship did not sink into the paper and might be wiped off with a wet sponge so that he did not spoil his manuscript. I recall that from an earlier uh, letter. I observed to him that there were few of his friends so accurate as that I could venture to put down in writing what they told me as of his sayings. As his sayings, rather. Johnson said, Why should you write down my sayings? Boswell said, I said, I write them when they are good. Johnson answered, Nay, you may as well write down the sayings of anyone else that are good. But where, I might with great propriety have added, can I find such? I visited him by appointment in the evening, and we drank tea with Mrs. Williams. He told me that he had been in the company of a gentleman, later footnote tells us this gentleman is James Bruce, whose extraordinary travels had been much the subject of conversation. But I found that he had not listened to him with that full confidence without which there is little satisfaction in the society of travelers. I was curious to hear what opinion so able a judge as Johnson had formed of his abilities, and I asked if he, had, if he was not a man of sense. Johnson said, Why, sir, he is not a distinct relater, and I should say he is neither abounding nor deficient in sense. I did not perceive any superiority of understanding. I said, but will you not allow him a nobleness of resolution in penetrating into dis distant regions? Johnson said, That, sir, is not to the present purpose. We are talking of his sense. A fighting cock has a nobleness of resolution. Next day, Sunday, April 2nd, I dined with Johnson at Mr. Holes. We talked of Pope. Johnson said, he wrote his Dunciad for fame. That was his primary motive. Had it not been for that, the dunces might have railed against him till they were weary, without his troubling himself about them. He delighted to vex them, no doubt, but he had more delight in seeing how well he could vex them. Let me change the emphasis here. That's not... I'm going to read that, read that again. He delighted to vex them, no doubt, but he had more delight in seeing how well he could vex them, I think is how that's supposed to be read. Anyway, the odes to obscurity and oblivion, in ridicule of cool mason and warm gray being mentioned, Johnson said, They are Coleman's best things. Upon it being observed that it was believed those odes were made by Coleman and Lloyd jointly, Johnson said, Nay, sir, how can two people make an ode? Perhaps one made one of them and one the other. I observed that two people had made a play and quoted the anecdote of Beaumont and Fletcher, who were brought up under suspicion of treason because, while concerning the plan of a tragedy, while sitting together at a tavern, one of them was overheard saying to the other, I'll kill the king. Johnson said, The first of those odes is the best, but they are both good. They exposed a very bad kind of writing. I said, Surely, sir, Mr. Mason's Elfrida is a fine poem. At least you will allow there are some good passages in it. Johnson said, There are now and then some good imitations of Milton's bad manner. <sighs> I often wondered of his low estimation of the writings of Gray and Mason. Of Gray's poetry, I have in a former part of his work expressed my high opinion. And for that of Mr. Mason, I have ever entertained a warm admiration. As Elfride is exquisite, both in poetical description and moral sentiment, and as Caractus is a noble drama. Nor can I omit paying my tribute of praise to some of his smaller poems, which I have read with pleasure, and which no criticism shall persuade me not to like. If I wondered at Johnson's now tasting, not tasting the works of Mason and Gray, Still more have I wondered at their not tasting his works. That they should be insensible to his energy of diction, to his splendor of images, and comprehension of thoughts. 
Tastes may differ as to the violin, the flute, the hot boy, in short, all the lesser instruments. But who can be insensible to the powerful impressions of the majestic organ? His taxation, no tyranny, being mentioned, I, I said, or Johnson said, rather, I think I have not been attacked enough for it. Attack is the reaction. I never think I have hit hard unless it rebounds. I said, I don't know, sir, what you want me at, what would you would be at? Five or six shots of small arms in every newspaper and repeated can cannoning in pamphlets might, I think, satisfy you. But, sir, you've never made out this match of which we have talked with a certain political lady. Later for note tells us this is Mrs. Macaulay. Since you are so severe against her principles. Johnson said, Nay, sir, I have the better chance for that. She is like the Amazons of old. She must be courted by the sword, but I have not been severe upon her. I said, Yes, sir, you have been made her ridiculous. Johnson said, That was already done, sir. To endeavor to make her ridiculous is like blacking the chimney. I put him in mind that the landlord at Ellen in Scotland said that he heard he was the greatest man in England, next to Lord Mansfield. Aye, sir, said Johnson. The exception defined the idea. A Scotchman could go no further. Quote, the force of nature could go, could no farther go. Unquote. Lady Miller's collection of verses by fashionable people, which were put into her vase Bath Houston Villa, near Bath, in competition for honorary prizes, this being mentioned, Johnson held them very cheap. But rhymes, said he, is a mere conceit, and an old conceit now. I wonder how people were persuaded to write in that manner for this lady. I named a gentleman, later footnote tells us this gentleman was Captain Constantine Phipps, later Baron Mulgrave of his acquaintance, who wrote for the vase. Johnson said, He was a blockhead for his pains. I said, The Duchess of Northumberland wrote. Johnson said, Sir, the Duchess of Northumberland may do what she pleases. Nobody will say anything to a lady of her high rank, but I should be apt to throw blanks verses in his face. I assume this blank here is that uh, Captain Constantine Phipps. I talked of the cheerfulness of Fleet Street, owing to the constant, quick succession of people, which we perceive passing through it. Johnson said, Why, Sir, Fleet Street is a very animated appearance, but I think the full tide of human existence is at Charing Cross. He made the common remark on the unhappiness which men who have led a very busy life experience, when they retire in expectation of enjoying themselves at ease, and that they generally languish for want of their habitual occupation, in which to return to it. He mentioned as a strong an instance of this as can well be imagined. Quote, an eminent tailor, tallow chandler in London, who had acquired a considerable fortune, gave up the trade in favor of his foreman, and went to live at a country house near town, he soon grew weary and paid frequent visits to his old shop, where he desired they might let him know their melting days, and he would come and assist them, which he accordingly did. Here, sir, was a man to whom the most disgusting circumstances in the business to which he had been used was a relief from idleness. Oh, and that's the end of that day, so good time as any to stop. Well, till next time. Oh, write in the comments what do you think Bo uh, Johnson did with those oranges. Bye from Boswell.